And welcome to the Vaughn A Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, uh, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, to learn more about the Second Realm, a uh, parallel network uh, built upon a foundation of truth, peace, and voluntarism, uh, to visit Pasnia, P A Z N I A dot com, uh, or consider joining our Pasnia Committee of Correspondence on Telegram. Uh, anyway, let's get on with it. Today, we venture into a subject that uh, I've been excited to cover in depth for at least a couple of years now. Um, that is the secret of light in the mind-blowing electric universe cosmology of the enlightened artist, Walter Russell, uh, which I hope provides a solid, real scientific foundation for, breakthrough, or I guess, the uh, breakthrough energy, energy discussions we've had and uh, will have on this podcast. So this is the uh, work that Nikola Tesla said should be hidden away for a thousand years, as uh, humanity wouldn't be uh, ready until then. And uh, well, scientific in nature, uh, this relates to all areas of the human experience, uh, spirituality, relationships, and love. I'm talking about a book uh, by uh, Leo Russell here called Love, which uh, I haven't read the entire thing, but uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, So-called life and death, uh, music, health and wellness, uh, really everything. Um, So yeah, the the importance can't be, uh, you know, overstated. Uh, The last thing I'll mention in the context of this Breakthrough Energy uh, for the Second Realm series is that uh, Walter actually demonstrated a Breakthrough uh, breakthrough Energy device called the Russell Optic uh, Dynamo Generator uh, based off his framework of the universe. Uh, This device powered their large 52-room university for a month. And uh, after demonstrating the efficacy uh, efficacy and realizing the massive changes this would have on society and freedom, uh, he donated it to the U.S. government. Uh, which, of course, never allowed the technology to uh, to be seen again. At least that's my understanding of it. And, and uh, um, beyond, yeah, beyond that, I don't know much about uh, what Walter, Walter prototyped. But my guest here, Matt Presti, uh, former president of the University of Philosophy and, uh, Philosophy and Science, uh, just might. So today we'll get an overall introduction to the work and science of Walter Russell, uh, his breakthroughs uh, with Breakthrough Energy, uh, as well as some on Matt and uh, how he got into this uh, really, really fascinating work. Uh, but before I bring in our guest, I do have Bueller, the head of our passing Department of Energy here. Um, he's only recently become familiar with, uh, familiar with Walter, and uh, I think that's good, um, because a lot of people are going to be you know, new to it, and I think about good questions. And he also has some back, a lot of background in, in, in these areas. So, um, yeah, it's good to have you here, Bueller. How, how's it going? Thanks. It's uh, going well. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of, I'm a new fan of Walter's, but I've been a big fan of the Electric Universe cosmology for quite some time. So I'm looking forward to getting into the science. Yeah, certainly, certainly. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, Matt, uh, welcome to the Vani Podcast, my friend. Uh, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing great, Shane. I appreciate the invite. Hey, yeah, for sure, for sure. So I guess um, I'll, I'll mention, I, th- I think the way that I found you and the way that I found uh, Walter and it, or, or Walter originally were through uh, Alpha, uh, Alpha Vedic, uh, the Alpha Alpha Cast. Um, Dr. Bear Lando is doing a lot of fascinating work and he incorporates the, a, a lot of the wave field, you know, the waveform physics um, and everything that he does, you know, uh, in the lab and also out in, you know, his gardens and things like that. So um, it's really, really incredible. Um, it's, it's good to have you here. Um, I guess uh, t- to start, could you, uh, you know, give us, uh, um, you know, give us uh, kind of your, your introduction, you know, um, tell us a bit about you, how you found Walter's work and uh, I guess how you got kind, kind of, uh, you know, where you are to where you are now. Sure. Um, 2008, I acquired the book, The Secret of Light. And that was a life-changing book. Uh, I swore I'd never need to read another book as long as I lived. That's what I exclaimed to my partner, Lori, at the time. Um, Of course, I went on to buy every book they had. I had to devour this man and woman's work. It was just absolutely life-changing, incredible. I've always had a desire to want to work with energy devices that make man's life easier and can allow us to... uh, progress so we can eventually populate the stars and start exploring the universe. So uh, ultimately, my love for the work uh, led me to produce a video series called the Secret of Light series, which is available at my YouTube channel as it still stands, if it's still up there. Uh, Hopefully it will last for a while. Um, Otherwise, Rumble, you can reach me there. But the Secret of Light series basically covered um in video form presenting the russell science for people i felt it was very important to get familiarity of his work out to the world he was probably the most famous person you've never heard of (laughs) Mm -hmm. and i got that a lot as president of the university i would eventually because of that series i got noticed by then president michael hudak president of the university of science and philosophy formerly the walter russell foundation And that was located at Swannanoa, a 52-room marble mansion on the top of Afton Mountain in Virginia, Shenandoah Valley, and the Blue Ridge Mountains, just an incredible, beautiful place. Uh, All the artwork was exhibited there. 
64 tons of art, sculpture, and personal effects. Those all went into storage in 1998. And again, because of the series I did and my Knowing the Creator 101 series, which is also available at my YouTube, uh, that President Michael Hudak recommended to the board that I secede him. And that became solidified in 2015, January 1st, when I started as Director of Operations for the USP and eventually became president one year later. Uh, 2017, July, we moved or actually we acquired a 32,000 square foot building in historic, beautiful downtown Waynesboro, just five miles from Swananoa, the mountaintop there. And so the artwork and everything, we made the huge move in October, November of 2018. All that artwork got moved by seven people in nine days. So basically, 11 semi tractor trailers full is wow. what we calculated. And uh, then setting it up took exactly nine months. And we had our grand opening on November 1st of 2019, a kind of grand reopening, you could say. And uh, so after that, um, I did a couple more years with the university. I served approximately seven years. And currently I'm, I'm in a startup company called Universal Power. And we're currently working on uh, energy efficiency, and that's where I'm at today. Amazing, yeah, that's a, that's a um, a great overview, and I appreciate that. Um, and I would definitely recommend. Um, I've read The Secret of Light twice, um, and then uh, the Universal one. I've gotten to page like I think the first time I got to like page 100, then I didn't touch it for a year, so I decided I'd restart it, and then I did that again for. Um, and now I'm on page like 30. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I feel like with the universal one, just like the images too, like you could sit there and just like, and as he was an artist, which is, I think what makes it even, which makes it that much more, much, that much more impactful is that, you know, the, the, you know, the words are great, but then the pictures, um, and the drawing, the, I guess the art is just, um, amazing and so intricate and detailed. Um, so, um, I guess, uh, yeah, if, if we could dive into, cause it's, 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 it's fascinating. Yeah. Like he was a, he was, he was a pretty famous guy. I mean, he, uh, I guess in one of your, re one of your interviews, I heard you say, you know, he rubbed shoulders with, you know, a lot of, you know, the, I guess the, you know, the, the leader types, uh, you know, the, you know, the so-called leader types. Um, he, um, yeah, he was, uh, you know, he, I guess he was, uh, uh, familiar with Tesla. I don't know how close, maybe you could talk a little bit, a little bit about that too, but I mean, he was a, he was a popular guy. I guess you had to tell us about Walter Russell and, and uh, kind of give us, give us his story. Sure. Well, Walter was what they referred to as the Illuminati of that day. We're not the Illuminati of today, which is actually the Deluminati, if you want to really term them correctly. But basically famous people. Uh, art was huge in New York. He ran in those circles. He was a prominent artist. He was the official portraiture artist for the Roosevelt, first Roosevelt administration, Teddy Roosevelt, particularly and was friends with Teddy Roosevelt and knew the children. And he raised horses at the time. He was an Arabian horse trainer. Uh, one of the other talents a lot of people don't know that he had as well as a woodworker, woodcarver, master at that. And uh, he would eventually go on to become the official sculpture, sculpturist for the uh, second Roosevelt administration, Franklin. Delano Roosevelt in the 40s. And so he was definitely well known. He, when he painted his Might of Ages, it was displayed around the world back in 1901, 02, he completed it. And then it went on a world tour and basically was uh, given the chance to uh, attend some of the, the greater museums around the world. Uh, never was officially as well recognized in the United States, but that's one of his more famous paintings that he's well known for. And it weighs quite a lot because I had to hang it along with my friend John, uh, who's current president of the university, John Bonsall. Uh, we, we spent nine months together hanging all this artwork and just incredible for one man to produce uh, 40 plus tons of art and sculpture, which really is only according to the story the backstory here at the university two percent of his total overall work the rest is out there in the world so we've been on a mission to try to reacquire some of it and have successfully 
Um, and it's just testimony to the mastery of what the human mind can do when it's focused. And he mastered all the five fine arts with only a fourth grade education. He was awarded 11 doctorates, um, one being a doctor of science for his work with discovering a whole three octaves of elements that precede hydrogen, as well as uranium and plutonium, Your, which he named uridium and and uh, another element that he named. So just a just a absolute maverick genius. And uh, unlike a polymath, a lot of people call him a polymath. I even used to call him a polymath, but that's an incorrect term as a polymath is an academician who is multifaceted and has multiple degrees. Uh, doctor never went to university. So he's as pure a genius as, as you can as you can name for an example, uh, much like a Leonardo da Vinci. In fact, he was called the Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci of the 20th century by Walter Cronkite oh, wow. on the eve of his passing. Uh, when Walter passed, they did a news report and they actually referred to him as the modern day Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, he was also known as the most versatile man in America. Uh, he was convinced that if you work two hours a day, but not more than two on five or six different things that you can master all of those things over a period of time. And it's often said he lived five lifetimes in one because he was again, a master of all the five fine arts. And uh, so he never dedicated too much time to any one thing. He did multiple things in a day. Uh, it's rumored that he would only sleep about 20 hours a day for a long period of time in his life because as he put it, he could lay down in the light and recharge with only a few hours of sleep, and then that would keep him going the whole day. So aside from that, his uh, divine spiritual illumination of 1921, around the time of his birthday in May, lasted 39 days. He wrote down 39,000 words, uh, and it basically led to his science and he was to give this science to man, which he did in 1926. He copyrighted the book, The Universal One, as well as four elements that science had yet to discover. And he did not get credit for those discoveries. Uh, we do have letters here in the archives that he wrote to the Nobel Prize Commission uh, asking for posthumous recognition, but they never did grant him even so much as a reply letter. Um, one day we hope to see that corrected and that do, uh, do tribute should be paid to this man. And it's often the case, you hear this story with a lot of different kinds of genius that they were mm -hmm. basically persecuted much like Tesla was, you know, they ended up taking all of his work and notes and, uh, locking it away and he died broke and penniless. That should not happen in this world for great geniuses like this. But the problem is that you're on this genius level, you meet with mediocrity. Mediocrity does not view life the same way. Often it wants to destroy it, persecute it. And uh, unfortunately, that's <laughs> that seems to be the order of things currently. But hopefully what I try to do with my work is get people interested in the Russell Home study course, which is a 12 month course. It's life changing material. It's a living philosophy on universal law and natural science. And so it's it's compatible with pretty much any religion. It doesn't require a belief system. There's no middleman between you and the creator in the way that this course teaches about God and creation and the power of the genius within you and how to unfold it. So really, um, Walter's work and Leo's work was just so inspirational to me that it led me to, by divine synchronicity, you know, to get involved with this university and be able to share the incredible work of these two really incredible people. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess a couple of things I just want to, I want to, I guess, bring up specifically, because I, I guess I, I had, I had a feeling, but I wasn't, I got to make it out. I got to, you know, plan a trip out there at some point. But so there's actually a, you know, a museum with, uh, with a lot of his artwork and, and, and that sort of stuff. And where, where is that? That's in Waynesboro, Virginia, 518 West Main Street. 
And you can find out all about it at philosophy.org. That's cool. the main site for all things Walter and Leo. I also have a video um, of the museum. It's called Rebirth of the Russell Legacy. So just type that into a search engine and, and you can watch a half hour video on the actual setup and move and, and the grand opening footage in there and the people involved with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I and I, I should have had a picture of it pulled up already, but um, you can find pictures of the, the university and yeah, it's, it's, you know, just, yeah, it's exquisite. Um, it's, it's incredible. Um, it's really incredible. And yeah, um, yeah, I guess uh, just a, a couple of things I want to hone in on, or at least, you know, one thing. You mentioned uh, the, the fourth grade education. I think that sure. I think he says something along, is a, there's a quote attributed to him, like, you know, anything beyond a fourth fourth grade education, you just basically have to learn unlearn, unlearn a lot of nonsense. Um, and that's very badly paraphrased, but, you know, you mentioned he only had a fourth grade education, which is crazy. And I guess, did, did he have any background in science or physics or anything before he um, went to this, uh, you know, I guess went to this meditative state and, you know, this, you know, that 40 day, you know, whatever it was. Um, did he have any background on this stuff before? No, he didn't. He did not. Uh, zero, in fact. So he had to learn all about the science of the day. He got many books on the subject. Um, to, to real quick address your quote before that, he had said, quote, one of the two greatest things that ever happened to me was losing my fortune which he likened that to uh, the banking collapse of 1908. He lost some 700 some thousand dollars, but he knew that he could earn it back, and he did. Um, and the other thing, that he was pulled out of school in the fourth grade early enough before it ruined him, and that's his quote. But okay, thank you for that. Regarding to the... The second question, he had no special interest to learn anything about science, but he was gifted in this 39 day illumination, hundreds of charts and drawings that he drew out, including the spiral wave of the elements, which he showed three octaves, fully toned octaves of elements prior to hydrogen, which are unknown to science. Um, in fact, he gave lectures around the world in the late 20s after the release of his Universal One. And he told researchers in California how they could discover heavy water. He predicted that they would also discover uh, uranium and iridium, which is uranium and plutonium, actually. And uh, ultimately, all these discoveries would never be credited to him. So he did what he was charged with. He delivered a new science to man and he felt that unfortunately man wasn't really ready for it because the first thing they did was weaponize the uranium and the plutonium into what is now known as the atomic bomb. So he would later go on with his second wife, Lau Russell, to write the book Atomic Suicide. And it's written, the title of it, in blood that's dripping in order to drive the point across to man the danger of using um, radioactive elements in his energy production or any kind of weaponry. So unfortunately, he felt that maybe some responsibility for giving the location of the elements to mankind, which he said were at a certain depth in the ground, and uh, ultimately felt like he wanted to try to rectify that with later work. But basically, when he released the Universal One, it was Nikola Tesla, one of the few who responded to the thousand books that went out. 300 went to major universities and 700 to prominent scientists around the world. Einstein was a recipient and Nikola Tesla, who wrote to him and said, you should lock this in a sepulcher for a thousand years because mankind has not unfolded enough to even begin to understand it. But thankfully... It was not locked in a sepulcher, and, and it is out there. Um, a brilliant mind of a man, uh, definitely not a scientist, but his science has already made possible new discoveries and things of that nature, which people most likely, in at least from the academic side, will never give the man credit for. But I've heard many things from many people, especially in the sciences, who say that you know, in their own labs, the labs of some major companies, there's charts of Walters hanging on the wall 
Wow. So whether they give the man credit or not, they're using his science to further their own uh, researches. And so one way or another, the man will receive credit. It might take a while, but eventually, and hopefully with some of the work I'm doing, we're going to make that a very real probability at some point down the road. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I suppose, I, cause, yeah, one thing, and I was showing um, a picture of the periodic table to the to the viewers, um, viewers you know, find it on Odyssey or Fascist Tube, whatever you guys prefer. Um, the video for, video podcast is out there um, for all of these. But um, but yeah, I guess one thing that just really drew me to, um, to I guess, the, I guess, resilient cosmology was, I guess, it, I mean, it resonated immediately. And then um, just the, um, I mean, like just the... Um, yeah, the, the terminology too, like uh, octaves and their corresponding wave field tones, and um, and you know it's 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 just it, it makes it makes a lot makes makes a lot more sense. It just kind of you know just kind of fits, um, and in the language it, it already kind of it already was kind of that way. You know, universe one song, um, so like it was already, like it, it just fit. It fit in with everything I'd been looking into. You know, with Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, they had different words for for it. But I think that's another another valuable thing. Another re reason I think it's good. I came across Walter when I did. Was because it basically just like put these things in like a modern light, I guess you could say. Um, but yeah, I guess would, sure. be, would be the way that I would explain it. So I guess um, we haven't really gone too, I guess, too much into, I guess, I guess, an introduction to um, you know the Walter Russell cosmology and you know maybe how it differs from um, you know kind of the, the I guess the mainstream you know mainstream science. So would would you mind doing that for us? Kind of give us an introduction to this cosmology. Yeah, the I'd say the main difference, in fact. It's from Walter himself. He said the cardinal error of science, meaning mainstream material science of the 20s, was the fact that they shut the creator out of its own creation. And that's like giving credit to a painting to some unknown forces, but ignoring the artist. Like if we take the Leonardo da Vinci and the Mona Lisa, and we start tearing into the Mona Lisa and saying there's you know, a cause to this painting somewhere. Uh, maybe it's in this particle of paint or this, you know, which this God particle that they're searching for that they'll never find uh, because the actual God particle is carbon. <laughs> Wait till they figure that one out. Um, but ultimately they tear into creation and all the while they ignore that there's a creator to it and it's to their own detriment. And so what Walter Science did firmly was put the creator into its own creation, centered it, put it firmly as the center of the entire cosmology that is the Russell cosmology. So um, there's full acknowledgement for the creative mind because Dr. Russell knew that as it takes a human mind to make things that we call man-made, and there's a hundred billion examples of man-made objects that I can uh, put on as exhibits for evidence, um, and as it takes a human mind to make things man-made, it also must take a cosmic mind to create nature because that's one thing mankind cannot create. But if creation takes a mind and if the proof of that concept is in everything man-made, then why not is it also safe to transfer that same working viable hermetic axiom of as above, so below, as within, so without, and put it upon nature and nature is exactly what we see and what it truly is is a reflection of the thinking of the creator and that's why it has the inspiration it does that's why it's it's called the greatest teacher the only teacher and uh, everything that we need to survive comes from nature itself and we are nature and so it's important that i think in russell's mind that you know, his very term of his own science, calling it natural science, was uh, basically a way of, of respecting that cosmic mind from which we all come and all return to. And uh, ultimately, that that's probably the main difference, because most of material science shuts the creator out, says it doesn't exist. It's filled with atheists, with quantum physicists holding the chairs of the universities, uh, when back in the early 19th or early 20th century and 19th centuries, the chairs of science departments were held by natural scientists. So everything became very much a material based uh, entropic heat death dying universe where Walter Russell's science is a two way motion universe that breathes in and out 
not just exhales like the Big Bang cosmology teaches. Okay, that's that's a really great explanation. Yeah, wow. Um, Bueller, you got anything? Uh, no, I'm just uh, taking it all in <laughs> uh, right now. Awesome. Good to hear. Pleasure so, to meet you, Bueller, by the way. <laughs> yeah, same here. Nice to meet you. Are as you well. uh, in, in Illinois as well? Uh, yeah, we're actually, we uh, live in the same He's location. He's behind the wall back there. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right on. Yeah, it was gotcha. the, consul- the, the Pasnia Consulate, as we would, as we would call it. But, you uh, mentioned uh, earlier Alpha Vedic. I'm actually going to be on their podcast again next week. Oh, that's amazing. That's good to hear. And I'm glad you great guys. Yeah. Yeah. For Mike sure. And, and Dr. Barry. Good, good folks. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Most definitely. And he is one of the, uh, you know, mentioning Barry, I mentioned him earlier on. Um, he's someone who came across the Walter Russell science a long time ago. And he's been, um, mm-hmm. you know, he probably treats a lot of people that were, might, might, he might have treated a lot of, you know, people that might have been in Walter's circles back in those days. Um, is kind of the, the, I guess, mm-hmm. the, the feeling that I get. Um, like he's that type of, that type of doctor. Um, so he came across Walter's cosmology and, or, you know, science and obviously he, he uses it, you know, in his practice. So that's, it's, it's amazing, amazing there. Um, but yeah, good, good to hear you're, you're going to be back on there. Just, uh, I, I suppose, yeah. um, in the context of Walter's science too, to, to go, I guess, to, to cover another, cause I, this is something else that is just, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a death based, you know, death based society, you know, the servile society is a death based society, unfortunately. Um, so like, obviously like life and death is such, is such a misunderstood concept now. Um, there's a lot of fear surrounding it because people don't, you know, everyone's confused as shit. They're, they're so busy, you know, busy trying to survive that there's no time to, you know, look into these sorts of questions. And, um, you know, the, the fear of death is a, a pretty major one, but, um, the way that, you know, um, you know, in this, uh, you know, w- you know, Walter science and, um, it's uh it's presented a lot differently um you know there's no there's it's not life and death it's what is unfolding and refolding so i guess could you talk a little bit about that sure well life and death are the sequences of pretty much all bodies in motion Uh, we live in a temporal universe and it's illusory in the sense that you know the real reality behind it and you have to explain this in really the trinity concept but The creator is one and creation is two and together that's three. So when the creator divides into sequences of polarized form and matter, we call those male and female and those male and female in order to reproduce an offspring must do as the creator and unite. So the polarity becomes one, the egg is fertilized and an offspring shoots off or springs off of the union of opposites and in alchemy the the alchemical marriage of opposites is the the key to alchemy it's one of the golden secrets but basically yourself as a human being has opposites a left and right a front and back a top and bottom we're cubicle in our nature all creation is cubicle three-dimensional and that says a whole lot about us as well but we're doubly charged uh we were both male and female obviously males are one chromosome extra than a female but nonetheless um we have male and feminine aspects of our personalities archetypally speaking from a Jungian perspective such as the same as well but ultimately again in alchemy the marriage of un- the union of the opposites or the alchemical wedding or the alchemical marriage is the unification of one's own hemispheres thereby becoming whole holy minded as in w h o l but it's funny we use the word holy but it doesn't quite mean the same thing when actually holy is more better thought of as w h o l e and uh I think that that approach to the universe and understanding God and creation also helps you understand life and death as being one. Uh, You can't live on this world if you don't excrete approximately two pounds of death from your body every day. And could you imagine what we'd look like if we did not do that? How Mm -hmm. huge we'd be? We would not be able to move, walk, or even build a house to live in. We We would explode at some point. So two pounds of death daily dies from every human body. Um, And that's, you know, that's a good thing. So the death and life processes are really one in that sense. 
They're just different aspects of, of the function of a body. But it takes death to create life, and it takes life to create death. And each are seeds of the other. And they're sequential, and they rhythmically balance and interchange. But ultimately, the reality behind it all is mind. And that's what Russell's science is, a mind wave universe. It's a model of how the creator thinks and how man can emulate the creator to be like to God in his creations as well. And that you can utilize that power, work knowingly with it moment to moment in your life, and thereby multiply all the endeavors and desires that you have within you, uh, basically unfolding your genius and learning how to live multiple lifetimes in one. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's amazing. And, um, I guess what, um, what's obviously, um, is I, I came across electric universe cosmology, just, I guess, more of the, um, you know, the, I guess the catastrophism, catastrophism variety, um, you know, it probably was, it's probably been 10 years ago by now, nine or 10 years. And Beeler has probably looked into it for, for longer than that. But, um, that was one thing that I immediately keyed into was, I guess the, um, I guess that, that, that aspect of it. So, um, I know like, uh, electricity and magnetism are, you know, um, explained, uh, you know, a lot, I guess in differing ways, um, throughout the book, whether it's, uh, you know, um, you know, centrif you know, centrifugal or, cent uh, or uh, centripetal, um, forces, um, I guess, could, could you talk a little, little bit about that? I guess kind of the, the, the physics of it and, um, electricity and magnetism and gravity within, um, this, within the science. Yeah, and just to baseline refer to people, I can give you a good explanation, but atomic suicide is going to have the most up to date. It's the final uh, distillation of the science. Uh, Universal One had basically, uh, he had to study all the books of science back in the 20s, and they were so against nature and so wrong, he said that the moon might as well be made of green cheese. And these atomics models that are made with the little wooden studs made them chuckle. So it's no such actuality actually happens in nature. Uh, the atom is not spinning particles. It's, it's made of waves. And so that's, that's a big difference to keep in mind. But atomic suicide, written in 1957 by both he and his wife, Leo, uh, really is the best final distillation. It explains gravity, magnetism, electricity, in, in the most clear and concise terms. And again, it doesn't divorce God out of the equation. In fact, it puts God at the center of it. In other words, God is mind and mind is shared by all men. So it's just who notices and who doesn't really that makes the difference in the production that people can, can do on this planet. But ultimately magnetism, uh, he would write that magnetism was basically a force in universal one uh, gravity. He, he changed the definition of as well. And also electricity. He switched from looking at electricity as positive and negative to a positive positive. And that basically the science of, of Walter Russell can be best thought of as a two way motion science. Um, all bodies breathe in and breathe out. The sun's magnetic field reverses polarity every 11 years. But it's not a magnetism effect. It's an effect of exhalation versus inhalation. So the sun breathes in for 11 years and it breathes out for 11 years. But that's what science is falsely calling a magnetic pole reversal or a reversal of the magnetic field. So ultimately, when you look at all bodies in the universe as breathing objects, living, breathing and dying objects, you know, everything has a lifespan. But ultimately, behind all life is the still white light of the still white light magnetic universe, basically, is what Walter called it. And that's at 90 degrees to all motion. So that would place God at the center of us, going straight down the center, which is also the plane of a cube, which is also the, uh, the fulcrum, as they call it. So all fulcrums are basically at 90 degrees to all motion. If you take a seesaw, it moves upon a fulcrum that does not move. So the power is not in the fulcrum. I'm sorry, the power is not in the moving object. It's in the fulcrum that doesn't move. And so that's, again, three. 
the motions of south magnetism or north and the block wall in the center or the domain wall is the location of the mind the god the creative power source and uh, that's the same way you can view electricity you can look at um, the chart of the chemical elements and see that along the block wall are the inert gases which are the master tones of the elements which are the projectors that make all the other elements in their spectrum and um, isotopes and such come to life so everything is really light and there's 18 dimensions of light within this one universe and basically all of them are different pressure conditions of one substance which is light and sound also comes from light and um, it's a very interesting science i think a lot of your viewers would really enjoy uh, for the science uh, a new concept of the universe is a great book if you're more on the scientific end of life or in, in your current studies that's a great book to start with you could also try uh, the secret of light and atomic suicide and of course the home study course and then the universal one is always you know that's a classic some people consider that his magnum opus beautifully written book but just to keep in mind that first introduction of the science back in 1927 uh, changed over time, over the 40 years of his uh, maturation to the version that is eventually to be found in Atomic Suicide. But quite a wonderful read and uh, more on the philosophy side of things. If you want to get into that, you can certainly check out the work of Leo, her book Love, her book God Will Work With You But Not For You, and then the Divine Iliad, Volume 1 and 2, which is the actual 39 days written out and explained with commentary it's just such an extremely inspiring curriculum and you can own all of it actually for uh literally less than fifteen hundred dollars and you don't have to go in debt for 30 years with a uh, university and then be taught leftist ideology that mm -hmm. makes you hate yourself and not even know what gender you are yeah. so um just for you guys i gotta share this um i was authorized to give you all to your listeners, 20% uh, off if people go to philosophy.org and want to order the books, oh, wow. enter in all caps, VANU20, V-O-N-U-2-0, and you will save 20% on your order. And orders over a certain amount are free shipping. So I recommend if your, it, your listeners are interested to take advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah, I would uh, certainly recommend. Yeah, awesome. yeah, certainly recommend that. Um, I I can personally attest to the secret of light. Um, the universal one is it's a beautiful read, but like it's one where I can only do like a chapter at a time, and then it takes like I feel like I have to step away from it for a time to like digest, and maybe even go back to that same chapter. But um, like the secret of light is more like just like reading a book. Um, I guess is is the way that I that I view it, and it's and it's obviously it's obviously mind blowing and all that, but. Um, for I guess for for my for my young, modern millennial mind, ew, I don't like even saying that, but um, I guess it is the truth. But uh, um, yeah, it worked better for me. So yeah, for whatever you're looking for, um, yeah, go go get it and check it out. Um, and I guess um, to to get I guess more into the the breakthrough energy um, part of this, um, which is crazy. Like again, it's crazy to think about this. Is um, just uh, you know this artist turned scientist turned like you know engineer. Um, and not just like a, a typical engineer, but someone who, with this understanding of um, the universe as he had it, um, was able to actually engineer something that was pretty miraculous that uh, people probably wouldn't believe was a possibility um, then. Um, definitely, you know, not today. Uh, you know, definitely, definitely then too. But uh, yeah, could you talk a little bit about uh, you know Walter's uh, optic dynamo generator? And um, I guess yeah, any information you can give on that because uh, it's yeah, I'm, I'm definitely curious. Sure. Well, you, you covered it really well in the beginning. You, you said everything right. Uh, he had a couple versions of it, and one version is upstairs in the science room on display. So anyone wants to come to uh, the Russell Museum will get to view that. Of course, it's by appointment only currently, so just visit philosophy.org, get the phone number, and, and uh, if you're ever passing this way through Virginia, by all means, stop. You can see the the optical dynamo generator up close and personal. Yeah. But basically what, what he did was create a generator that optically sends electricity into through an implosive um, motion 
to basically two coils and these coils would multiply and step up that electricity until it met in the middle between the two and heat would be created and he would heat a pipe with water that would then instantly turn it into steam and would turn a steam turbine. And that is what he used to run Swannanoa on a de demonstrable scale for approximately a month. Um, he did actually give a version of this to NORAD from what we can determine through the archives that we've studied. And I think it was dismantled and was never, to my knowledge, now they could have obviously, there's you know these secret programs and whatnot, but from what I understand, they, this was dismantled or they never could get it to work. So that's just what best evidence we have from, you know, the archives that we've been able to determine what, what actually happened with that. But um, ultimately, his optical dynamo generator was meant to be a device that would free mankind from um, his enslavement to fossil fuels and things of that nature, which have a limited supply and are very costly to mine as well as collect and then distribute and transport and Obviously, there's just, uh, you know, the need for, for new upgrades in the way that man produces electricity. But in order to achieve those upgrades, man must first renew his mind. Because if you do not renew the mind, then nothing new can come from, from uh, any kind of output. So, mm -hmm. in other words, unlearning what you have learned is really one of the harder parts of learning something new because especially yeah. if so-called laws aren't laws after all so you have to in an academic sense you know it's it's very difficult for academicians to unlearn things that they've earned diplomas for but folks like dr russell i would say he just had many more degrees of vision and if you if there's 360 degrees of of vision let's say that a human being can attain that it's possible for humanity to attain um just because you have one degree from a university doesn't make you understand the processes of nature and the universe but walter through his illumination and through his divine experiences and his understanding had many more than just one in fact he could probably see the whole 360 degrees of mind and so he tried to give that to man um and man just really wasn't ready for it. So that's that's the order of the day for most genius in the world. They are they have to face the mediocrities of the world, and they're often um, persecuted, incredibly so, for their knowledge that they have. And such is the case with example after example: Charles Goodyear, Nikola Tesla, Victor Schauberger. There's just so many who aren't welcome at the table and especially by academia because academia has its own curriculum it's been in in service for many years and it's not something they're going to quickly move away from so they say the world changes by many funerals you know that's a saying unfortunately yeah. that rings true but nonetheless um you know mankind is meant to progress he was created to progress and so by the renewing of his mind and coming across new knowledge and new information is the way we're going to see that change. Yeah. And um, for the video viewers, I've been showing some um, at philosophy.org. Um, there's a page on the Russell Optic Dynamo Generator. I was showing some pictures of it. Um, yeah, some, some pictures of it. And I thought I'd read this for the, for the benefit of the audio listeners. Quote, this new power and light generator employs a multiplication principle of nature, which has not yet entered within the realm of human consciousness. It is the principle of growth in nature which multiplies of one kernel of corn into thousands, or it multiplies the cold of space into hot stars and novas of incredibly high temperature. Power multiplica multiplication is the most conspicuous characteristic of nature. It is amazing to me that it has never yet been discovered. So that's just, uh, I guess, uh, one paragraph on it, but definitely go, um, definitely go check it out. Um, and I, I heard you mention hydrogen, and we're really, I don't know how, how much that plays into it here, but that was something on my outline. Um, we're really into um, 
looking into Brown's gas sort of solutions for energy. But um, what got me into um, the realm of, of hydrogen or Brown's gas or, or whatever was the health angle of it. So we've got an aqua, one of George Wiseman's aqua cures here um, that's, um, you know, we drink the water every day and I breathe on it for five or six hours every night when I'm sleeping. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the, there's the molecular hydrogen, which is what mainstream science looks at for that. Um, but there's the, the Brown's gas component of it, which Bueller could explain that better than I could. And, um, and I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, I've heard you talk about hydrogen and carbon before specifically like in, uh, within the, uh, you know, Walter Russell science. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious to hear anything you, any, anything you have on hydrogen, um, you know, for like within, within this context, I'd, I'd be, I'd definitely be curious. No, oh, I uh, think you're muted if you're talking. Yeah, anything hydrogen-based, you know, is created by electricity. In fact, this is an electric universe, so it's it's best to see it as it truly is, you could say, um, as opposed to a gravitic magnetic one, which is what they lock you into in academia, which is why we continually produce uh, and electricity with disastrous results that are called pollution. You know, when you understand nature and you work like nature and your machines work like nature, there's no pollution. That tells you that you're doing it the right way. And uh, I think we have a lot to learn in that category, but ultimately, yeah, if you electrically uh, stimulate water in the right way, you can divide it into its constituent parts and collect the hydrogen from it and use it. And uh, optimally, the way that the Brown's gas generator works is it does just that. And then it uses, without having to store the hydrogen, making it potentially explosive and, and uh, dangerous, you just use it as it's made on the fly. And uh, I know a guy who actually had a Brown's gas generator in his chevy blazer and he drove it to florida and back and got double the gas mileage yeah. that other people got and this was 20 years ago um his buddy todd back in the day but uh ultimately it's you know the the technology is there we just have to have the desire to do it and more people i think as necessity dictates necessity being the mother father of all invention uh, once things get hard enough or shitty enough or too expensive we hopefully will see more people take an interest in that. And that's where I think studying alternative sciences, reading more of, of the genius work of the Schauberger's, the Tesla's, the Murray's and the, the lead Scalinans, and just really getting to understand those really incredible minds, the Russell's of the world, that's going to lead us into the next era or the, the next civilization to come. And I'd like to see that hopefully what Walter said was just as important as a new science is also a new philosophy that's a living one so that we know how to handle the scientific advancements because if you don't have the character to handle an advance in science you'll simply use it to destroy your fellow man or for your own greed or for some other nefarious purpose so growing the character of man is essential to also handling new discoveries and new scientific applications that will free himself from the chains of laborious uh, loads of work that he could otherwise spend making art as opposed to mining it, elements that he could uh, also make free uh, cheaper, more affordable energy and non-polluting sources of electricity production. And ultimately that's going not to come from academia, but it's going to come from these mavericks who academia turned out, you know, and it's up to us to, you know, stand on the shoulders of the giants and, and do something with what they've left us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Bueller, I actually do have something that um, another component of hydrogen, which I, I would, I guess I, um, I'd be curious to hear about from, from the Walter's view is, um, and does given a little bit away here, but it's on YouTube. It's not like it's secret. Um, but um, you can apparently use um, like a Brown's gas torch to turn aluminum oxide into sapphire or rubies. Um, so like it's there, like there's, there's some, there's some magical shit with hydrogen. I'm not quite sure what, it, like, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is, but like, it's just one of those things that now that I know about it, like I'm not, it's never going to leave my, 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 my thought, um, for all of these reasons. It's like, yeah, you, you, you breathe it for health, you drink it for health. 
use it to you know cut through metals you can use it to turn uh, normal raw materials into you know like yeah they are lab created you know um you know mineral or whatever but like it and then yeah you can use it and d double the gas mileage in your car but yeah bueller take it away my, my friend yeah from what i understand about brown's gas is it's a little bit more than just uh hydrogen and oxygen mix uh, a lot of people think of it as hho as a simple uh, like oxy hydrogen mix but uh, there's a lot more to it than that especially when it's uh, produced in the electrolysis manner uh, it's produced in a very electron rich environment and those electrons are carried uh, by the hydrogen and the oxygen and even some of the water vapor also accepts extra electrons as well and becomes like a plasma state but some of these hydrogen ions uh, that take on an extra electron they become like uh, hydride and uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very electron it's probably the most electron dense element in the universe and it readily donates those electrons to serve as like an antioxidant and an antacid as well and I think something to do with like the Brown's gas torch. Um, it, it seems to reach, they, they claim it has like a five to 10,000 degree uh, potential like flame or whatever. But I guess when measured, it's only like 130 degrees Celsius or something. And you can pass your hand through it, but yet you can also melt tungsten with it. And I think some of that effect is not necessarily from the BTUs of the combustion raising the temperature, but something about the electron rich environment causes the the metallic bonds to somehow like uh, kind of dissociate and uh, maybe lowers the melting point of the metal is is probably what it's doing, my guess. Interesting. But yeah, um, so under those conditions, you know, um, I guess you can take like aluminum oxide, for example, melt it back down into a liquid. And then as it cools, it, it can cool into uh, sapphire depending on what's in it. Like if it's pure aluminum oxide, it'd be white sapphire, but with iron or titanium would be blue sapphire. And with chromium, like 1% chromium or a few percent chromium, it would cool into a ruby. So I think that's pretty interesting how some of these things occur under what we think is just um, a combustive flame, but there is definitely something to do with the, uh, the extra electrons that are carried, carried on those ions as well. Yeah, that's highly interesting. Um, with regard to the sapphire, have you actually seen that process? In, in I've person? seen it on YouTube. I have yet to recreate it myself, but I'm looking forward to doing so. I'm actually going to build an electrolyzer that's going to be dedicated for to a torch to to do just that. So I'll let you know when I find out. Please do. That that would be very cool to witness. <laughs> we'll yeah, do. and it's so so to bring up Dr. Berlando again. Um, because uh, there was an interview. He was, I, it was, it's, it's. I don't remember what the, what interview it was that he was doing, but someone was like, you know, if someone's out there making gold, and you know, in the U.S., it's him. And because I've, I've heard him mentioned in podcasts before, you know, using you know waveform mechanics, um, is what the, I guess the terminology that he uses. Um, but yeah, like, uh, um, it's same thing. It happens in the electrolyzer. There's this sludge that forms. Um, and if you had gold electrodes, you would literally create gold through this process like it's 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 crazy what's you know what what well, you know what it's crazy to think about um like you know and i think the you know like i i, I don't know I'd, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that matt if you have anything else to add well yeah i mean if if you look at the russell science he clearly tells us you know this is an electric universe and the elements are all there's basically one element and that's light and light goes through a lifetime from life to death, it begins to our senses at hydrogen, but actually starts uh, three octaves further ahead than that. But this life cycle of light matures at carbon, so your hole in, in the element is larger at birth, and it begins to close as it approaches the center of the wave field which is carbon, the God particle, which is a fully closed hole. It's called the fusion state of light in Russell science. And then beyond that, the hole begins to open up until it becomes bigger and bigger and matter unwinds itself faster and faster. And that's basically one cycle of an electric wave. You're looking at, when you look at Walter's work, you can also look at it as one cycle of an electric wave. But electricity itself is 
what creates the pressure conditions, which is what creates the frequency and the vibratory rate. So gold has a certain vibratory rate. Silver has a certain vibratory rate, as does copper. And if you can create a device that can create the conditions of pressure, which are equal to that of gold, then by rights, you should be able to transmute any substance into that gold. But there is the key is how, how to use that application, how to apply that. And that's stuff that I, I think you could have teams of people working on for centuries to try to figure out. Um, but basically understanding the mechanics of it, the actual underlying process of this electric universe is that different elements appear to us because of their pressure conditions, making them vibrate in such a way that they have these different appearances. But again, if, if one can see the process and, and create a device that can mimic that process, then out of nothing can one create something which resembles any element. And uh, I think it's a matter of time that before that gets, you know, pretty much discovered. But ultimately, Russell himself at Westinghouse Lab in 1929 or 30. He read my mind. He demonstrated. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah, was going to have you mention. Go. go for it. <laughs> he, he, he demonstrated transmutation of water into uh, 60 some percent nitrogen and other elements within the medium he was using. And they did not believe the results. The scientists questioned his results over and over. And he finally performed this experiment with different types of uh, tubes that he had to create. And ultimately, he just gave up after 17 attempts to convince these people that they were actually witnessing transmutation. And so he just said, that's it. I'm done. I'm not going to waste my time. You guys keep telling me it's faulty equipment. It's not. I'm done this 17 times in a row. How much more do you need to see it? I've got better things to do. So he just he gave up on them because they couldn't believe what their own eyes had witnessed. And again, that's mediocrity. When when mediocrity is confronted by genius, it it's not generally nice. <laughs> but uh, so such is the case that genius has to, you know, it's crucified. They say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Well, that, that's that's all. Um, you know, I'm glad to hear that. It, you know, that that fits into. Um, I guess the, it fits into the Walter Russell cosmology because there there's one thing I, I was I was gonna breeze past it but um i think it's um, i think it might actually be important to um to bring up here um but i found so so um you know mentioning um walter's optic dynamo generator there's a guy on youtube um it goes by benny st vincent and he's um been and obviously i can't verify this myself and when i came across this two years ago um i definitely didn't know how to verify whether he was actually doing what he was saying he was doing so there's that aspect of it too but i came across um so so there was um you know um Bear, you know Bear lando and alpha vedic but then um there's a different channel that i came across where you know is a flat earth channel and they were the ones you know you know doing a lot of research into um into russell's you know into into his actual inventions and things like that and making this, this stuff demonstrable so um, I think it's it's at least worth addressing because, um, I mean, um, I mean those folks, you know, the the flirters, I think is as you call, have, I've heard you call them before, which is you know shorter. Um, like they they tolerate um, they tolerate Russell, um, and whereas you know like there's there's there seems to be a tendency to basically crucify people pretty quickly. But like I think it might be the electric universe aspect of it or whatever. Um, but I guess how does that fit into, or it doesn't, but I mean, could you, could you talk a little bit, a little bit about, I guess, to speak to that a little bit, does, does, uh, does that cosmology fit with, uh, with Walter Russell science? No, it doesn't actually, but, um, I think because of the, the nature of the Russell science, the, the plane of a cube is of course a flat surface. Um, that's where a lot of the FE crowd kind of latches on, but. Unfortunately, the cube and the sphere in Russell science, as Russell stated himself, are the sole working tools of creation. Uh, the cube is the sphere compressed and, and the sphere is the cube expanded. And so that's what we see populating space. You can't see the cube. 
you can know it by the center. Everywhere you find a center, a fulcrum, there is the plane of a cube there or an equilibrium or an equator. All equators are planes of cubes. You know, that's, a, again, people have a lot of confusion when it comes to understanding these dynamics because they're new, they're different. But I would recommend people check out the mirror cube. There's mirror cubes. I've done videos on it. Um, Walter Russell's idea of a mirror cube was created by a gentleman named Jeff a couple decades ago. And uh, really, it, it shows you the optical nature of the universe and how flat spaces create curvature of light. And that's really what's happening. And that's why optically our eyes are spherical because nature creates spheroidal shapes so that it can be basically viewed and witnessed by the body itself. Um, mind is non-dimensional and it unfolds into three dimensions basically, but those dimensions are not the mind. So there, therein lies this uh, sort of the simulated effect of matter being the cause of a non-dimensional or being the effect of a non-dimensional cause. But ultimately, you know, the sphere is that which is the, the greatest shape when it comes to, to handling the immense pressures. And there is, you know, there's no empty space as the FE community believes, you know, just because NASA says it, you know, I don't agree with that either. And no matter who says it, there's space is full of a full three octaves of matter. You know, they happen to be gaseous, but there's still three octaves of matter in space that ex accounts for the motions of light. It's not an ether. It's not particles bumping into each other to transfer the motions of light. It's the gases of space themselves, which uh, these cubic wave fields and all wave fields repeat light in every wave field. Therefore, light does not need to travel, number one. So, and number two, I think it just, it behooves people, you know, get into the science, take a look at it. Again, you can get the new concept of the universe book for rather cheap. And if you're poor and broke, then get it off the internet, it's free find it somewhere, but, you know, give yourself the opportunity, read it, absorb it, and think differently about the universe. Because if we continue to think the way that academia has trained everybody, then we're never going to have anything but what is already offered, which doesn't work, which pollutes, which costs too much money, and which <laughs> basically enslaves the whole human race to a group of energy barons, central bankers, and warmongers who are about to destroy the planet. So it behooves us all to take a look at alternative information and through the new renewing of our minds and the desire, uh, anything's possible, folks. We just have to put our hearts and minds to it and get to work. Yes, and, and on that note, that, that was something I wanted to circle back around to, and you mentioned it in passing um, earlier, and I've just got this. This is one one final topic, and then a listener, a, a couple, um, I guess, uh, one listener, uh, one, I guess, listener question. And, um, okay. and I think that, that that'll be it, but, um, but yeah, speaking in sure. terms of what you just, what you just finished up, um, carbon, um, so carbon as, as the God particle, um, cause as, as I understand it, um, so, um, carbon is six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons, six, six, six. Um, that doesn't mean anything, but like, that was like the first thing when I, when I, I made that connection, it's like, why are they trying to turn people as, is that it's how they are with everything? It seems like, uh, like germ theory, they're like streets germinate. It seems like it's trying to kill life. Um, you know, looking at, you know, you look at language this way, like I do, and that's kind of the connections that you make. But um, I guess, um, could you talk, hey, talk, tell us about uh, carbon um, within the, the Walter Russell cosmology and it being, it being, being uh, the God particle? Right. Again, it's the fusion element. I mean, it's, it's got a closed center where every other element has a hole in the center. And you can verify this by typing in tungsten atom and look at the microscopy photos that Erwin Mueller had photographed from the 50s of the tungsten atom. It shows you clearly that tungsten has a hole in the center. And so it's, it's best to think in terms of waves when you really, if you really truly want to understand matter. If I throw a stone into a pool or into a pond and you see, let's say 10, 10 rings form around that stone Okay, those rings aren't little particles spinning around the rock. 
really fast. They're waves, right? Well, that's exactly what you see in electron microscopy photos. Again, Erwin Mueller is, is the father of that. And you can take a, a great look at some of his photos in, in a book he wrote that has multiple photos within it. But that is the true nature of atomic structure. Also, Darren Colomb did a, a interview, a, a, a talk, a presentation by the same name, The True Nature of Atomic Structure, which is highly informative and valuable. And I encourage your listeners to check that out. So ultimately, carbon is the God particle because it's the most common element in the universe. It's got 10 million known chemical bonds that we know of. Uh, we're carbon-based life forms, and it's ironic that they say that carbon is an enemy because carbon being the God particle in Russell Science, he didn't refer to that himself. I gave it that name because it, it's suited to it. <clears throat> the crystal of carbon is the diamond. And the diamond is used in the wedding ceremony to represent the male and female uniting, which is also what carbon is. It's the perfect balance between male and female. The hardest substance is carbon, uh, the diamond that is. Um, so there's just so many things about it that it really is the most balanced element in the universe. And that's because it is a fusion element. It's got a closed hole at the center. And uh, it's best to think of atomic matter as having an, a, you could call it by proton, electron, proton, neutron, electron, or you could say you just adapt those words slightly and say the protonic force is the inward, which is the twin opposing vortices. The neutronic is the center or the point of reversal. And then at 90 degrees is the electronic or the emission or the expansion of that inhalation to become an exhalation. So just like we breathe in, we hit the block wall, we hit the, the domain wall, we have to go the other way. We breathe out. So that's basically, you're hitting that 90 degree point and reversing direction. And everything in nature does this, you know, and interestingly enough, it's provable. Um, so often we don't recognize the fulcrum in anything and a good exercise for that is to learn to look at what is not moving. You open a door, what doesn't move? Well, the door jam. Look at what the hinges are screwed into. That's not moving. So where's the power? Is it in the door or is it in the jam? Where's the power of a seesaw? In the ends of the seesaw or in the fulcrum of the seesaw? And who is it Archimedes that said, give me a lever long enough and I can move the whole universe? Because he knows that the power isn't in the lever, it's in the fulcrum upon which the lever moves. And the more we notice what doesn't move, the more we'll begin to realize that that is also the loca location of the creator and the source of all power in the universe, the source of all motive power that makes bodies move. Yeah. And it's unlimited. You can draw as much as you can possibly imagine out of it. You just have to work to get it out, to pump it out and put it into motion, as Dr. Russell would say. Yeah. Uh, one thing I really like about this cosmology is that it's very intuitive in nature. Like when I first hear it, it kind of resonates as true. And um, another thing you mentioned was the uh, observing of the the waves, like the electron orbitals, I guess they would call them in traditional science. And when you look at them under an electron microscope, you can see different shapes. They're not totally spherical. Uh, some of them are toroids with holes in the middle. Uh, some of them are like lobe shaped. And so I would not be surprised that a lot of elements um, besides carbon have these like holes in the middle, as you say. Um, and it kind of also reminds me of this whole, I guess, debate between the gravitational and the electrical cosmologies where, um, like, let's say dark matter, right, is this theorized substance to exist, which exerts some sort of attractive force in the universe. And I know that the electrical universe or electrical cosmology uh, likes to explain that with uh, electrical charge and uh, not only um, electrostatic attraction, but also um, the attractive force that happens when these uh, charged particles are actually moving. So like an electrically charged particle creates a magnetic field and the moving magnetic field creates an electric field, that kind of thing. And so um, when it comes to dark matter and this like hidden attractive force within the universe, 
um, I kind of start to wonder if maybe some of these elements that are precursors to hydrogen that have yet to be discovered might fill that gap of what uh, the gravitational cosmology calls dark matter and what the electrical cosmology uh, thinks of as electrostatic attraction. Dark matter has no existence. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, it's, it's kind of like the ether theory. It, it's a conceptual crutch to explain. Um, I agree with a, that, actually. Yeah, and, and uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of hokey theories out there that are so supernatural and just completely mythematical. Um, mathematics has invented a lot of myths that unfortunately become these pursuits of endless academic circular masturbation, uh, mental masturbations, <laughs> and then they molest us with their masturbation. So it's like, you know, in order to really truly understand nature, one has to first understand the mind behind it. Because again, this is what Russell calls the cardinal error of science is removing a creator from its own creation. It'd be like removing the poet from the poem or the painter from the painting, the composer from the symphony. You know, all of these things that exist take a mind to create it. But yet we divorce that, that truism and then say that all of creation was just an accident from a giant explosion that has no purpose that is gonna blink out in a big rip and everything dies, the whole universe, you, me, everything. And it's just a really dismal, almost psychotic way to look at creation. And it Whereas, is counterintuitive to me. It is. It really, truly is. And when you look at gravity, <clears throat> for instance, you know, Isaac Newton sees an apple fall, but he didn't explain how the apple got up in the air in the first place. You know, the, the rotting apple decomposed and the gases rose against the so-called in, uh, inward pulling force of gravity in the opposite direction. And then the tree grows up in the opposite direction to this force of gravity. How, how, how did Isaac Newton explain that? He didn't. He never, he never told us how the apple got up in the air in order to fall. You know, so obviously gravity goes in more than one direction right? It goes in two, obviously. So again, when, when you have a Russell come along and he points this out, they get all defensive, you know, and say, but our sacred laws are, these are our cows, leave them alone. Well, he's not trying to slaughter the cows. He's trying to just tell you that the moon is in fact not made of green cheese, that you might want to just take a look at this from another <laughs> angle, you know, and Ultimately, the heat, death, dying universe of a Big Bang, the whole Big Bang cosmology has unfortunately thrown science into its own conundrum, making it incompatible with the actual physical laws of nature. And uh, all this that has rolled out of it, it tries to account for this mistake. So the string theory, the big, you know, the uh, dark matter, the strong and weak nuclear forces all have no existence. It's simply mental masturbation to to say this truthfully and ultimately it needs to be discarded just throw it in the wastebasket and actually start from a foundation that does actually explain the two-way motion breathing universe it's ironic to me that just five years after walter russell released the universal one he was notified by the by the uh um the Vatican by the Pope that if he was to continue to uh, publish the Universal One that the Pope would issue a decree against him and he would never work anywhere in the world again and he might even be you know suicided <laughs> wow. and this is in Russell's own words he, he said people disappear for going against um, basically going going against scripture or against the uh, established belief systems. So ultimately that's probably one of the main reasons he did not want to republish the Universal One was because he was notified that, you know, there was gonna be an action taken by the Pope directly. So, you know, doctrine is stronger than 
than reality in, in many cases. And we see that, uh, unfortunately, um, happening in the world. But ultimately, you know, Walt, Ru Russell did not go away. He continued to hammer at science and remonstrate against it. And he ridiculed the idea of the quantum theory, saying it has no existence whatsoever and is a travesty to nature. Nature does not create energy in packets like salt and pepper packets. I mean, it's waves. We live in a wave reality and it's a mind wave universe and it's caused by mind. And that will one day be provable. It's just man has to open himself up to, again, the understanding that all creation requires a creator, that we live in a creating universe, not a created one. And that's, you know, determinism, for its instance, could, can only exist if the universe is created, whereas free will can only exist in a creating universe. So there's your difference mm. right there. Yeah, I like And that. ultimately, they just want us to think that this is a one-way heat death dying universe. Again, that will just die at some point. And uh, what I was going to say about the 1927 release of the Universal One, it was but five years later. See, Walter releases his two-way motion universe that inhales and exhales endlessly forever. And then science comes along, the Catholic Church comes along, and they release a through through the uh, Jesuit priest Monsignor Georges Lemaitre, they release the one-way heat death dying universe in 1931, which becomes the standard model of all of physics around the whole world. Mm -hmm. And that was not an accident. I think it was a cover-up to stop this idea of a two-way motion universe from from catching on. That's my personal opinion, though. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, fascinating. Go ahead, Bueller. I was going to say it almost seems like it's their rebuttal or their defense against it, perhaps specifically. It very well could be. I mean, Einstein embraced it. Um, Niels Bohr, you've got so many people that embraced, you know, the whole of it. And yet it's it's a Catholic origin theory, you know, but I'm, I thought all the scientists were atheists. So why would they entertain a, a religious theory of the origin of the universe. Yeah, and if you tell this to some of these point. atheist scientists, their, their heads explode. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, that, that's, that's, that's another cool. type of faith. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, 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 that's really, really, yeah, that's, that's, that's really good to mention because I don't think people think, I don't think people think about it a lot. Um, like how much of our, like even atheists, like the, I mean, it, it's, um, like how much of our reality, like our science or scientific reality is dictated by like a church. Um, like even the calendar, like the Gregorian yeah, calendar, absolutely. Um, like the entire way that we keep yep. our clocks here is literally from a Pope. So like it, it's, yeah, one it's, of the it, biggest it, telescopes in the world is named Lucifer and the Catholic church true. owns it. <laughs> yeah. Go figure that. <laughs> yeah. Don't they have phalluses in their courtyard too? Like they do in, in Washington, DC. Anyway. Um, there you go. Yeah. But uh, that so I guess yep. there there was one follow up question I had um, Matt from from when you we were talking sure. about carbon so we're circling back around and then what I I I, I do uh, value your time I, I want to get, get you out of here reason and re reasonably um, but no so problem. so back no to problem. I'm happy to right on um, so yeah so back to carbon um, and this is not a paid promotion for Alpha Vedic or anything like that it's like I talk about them all the time it's just it's it's whatever but um, so they had the, the one of their products I, I used to order a lot more but now it's like I keep one of their products in, in stock and it's carbon C60 their C60 oil uh, C60 black seed oil I've used it um, several times yep so I guess um, I and I should have looked into it more by now especially considering it's like I I, I know it works like verifiably a thousand times um, but I guess what like carbon 60, like, like what can you give any insight on that? I mean, it's shot in the dark, but what do you, what do you think? Well, you know, it's, it originally started as a, as a treatment for horses, but it's got a lot of benefits. Um, I don't want to say with a hundred percent certainty what exactly it does, though it does, uh, for me when I used it. Um, I was just more or less giving it a shot to see what, what, if any effects, I didn't notice a whole lot to be quite honest, but again, there's different variants, different grades of it. Uh, you do be careful if you're ordering, these are kind of exotic treatments. So, um, 
don't let the pursuit of health be so much that you end up unhealthy through the pursuit of it. Right. Um, you know, I, I think diet is one of the most important things we can do. And of course, keeping your liver healthy, keeping yourself uh, hydrated and, you know, just as, as good a quality food organics as you can get and such. But uh, yeah, th the, the carbon 60 is, is basically a, it's, it's something that, you know, a carbon-based life form like us, <laughs> you know, it, it helps to lube things. It keeps things in, in good, good form, you could say, by the structure. Um, there's a particular water in the world. I'm, I'm going to have to draw back on this because it's been quite a, quite a many seasons since I've, I've looked into it. But mm -hmm. a particular water in the world that is... Uh, it runs through a carbon kind of process and it's really, really life charging water, but ultimately the Hunza you know, water, you, what is that? Is it the Hunza water? Yeah, I think so. That sounds about right. And this tribe or this locale where the people drink it live to be quite old. Right. So, yeah. it's, uh, but ultimately I think it's just, you know, if you look at it as the most balanced particle in all of nature, or the most balanced element, let's call it. It'd be the most balancing is. then too, wouldn't it? It would be, yeah, in, in that term. But again, it's, you know, there's different grades. There's some knockoffs that aren't actually that at sure. all. And so yeah. you got to be very careful what kind of oil it's in. You want high quality stuff. You don't want to be messing with some stuff that might end up making you sick. And mm -hmm. so just be careful. If you're going to use it. Make sure it's a highly reputable source. I would trust Dr. Barry Lando. Yeah. If yeah. That's who Alpha Vedic is good stuff. Me. He's a good guy. I've had him on occasion to meet him. Uh, not in person yet. Hopefully one day. We're going to have a conference here in, in the future at some point, And I'm definitely going to see if he'd like to attend at the uh, Russell Museum. We have a giant meeting room there. And uh, hmm. it'd be a great place to host a conference at some point in the future. Oh, yeah. Bear would be a great a great fit there. Yeah, I, I hope to see that in the future, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so I guess last... Yeah, uh, he's a good uh, guy. Very knowledgeable. For sure, for sure. So I'm working one one listener question here, and it, it, it's, a, it's a simple one. It's not, you know, a deep philosophical one. But and I'm, I'm curious, too, sure. within the past... Uh, so, like, since 2020, um, um, the, the question is basically, I'm curious what, what you've seen as a trend for, you know, SEALs or interest in, you know, the Russell science over the past few years. Um, has it sped up any? What do you think? You know, any any uh, endeavor that is, let's just say, impossible takes time to make happen. But ultimately, um, when you witness something that was once seemingly impossible become possible, then really the whole world's at your fingertips. And that's not just for science, but for anybody you know, anybody that thought they couldn't do something and are now able to do it, remember the value of that lesson because it tells you a lot about humanity. It tells each of us a lot about ourselves. You know, we should never really look at this world or this universe as being something, anything within it. Don't look at it as being impossible. You know, make, as Audrey Hepburn said, impossible really means I'm possible. So that's what you're really saying. I'm possible. And if you put your heart and mind to it and you reach out and you talk knowingly in your heart with God about it and God being mind, universal mind itself, you know, learn to have a relationship with that power because that is what makes all things possible. And anything you can imagine in the world can become a real thing if you do the work to get there all things in nature work if baby birds didn't learn to fly they wouldn't survive if if nature didn't do the things it does it wouldn't be nature it wouldn't be there and the same with man man is not this is not the end of humanity it's just the beginning you know we we have to learn to trust in ourselves and you know when we work knowingly with that creative force that divine mind within us all things become possible and nothing any longer is impossible. So and my advice to the person who wrote the question and 
and all the listeners, you know, get yourself some of these books. They're life changing. Uh, the Secret of Light is one of my all time favorite. It's it's like masterful poetry mixed with philosophy, mixed with science. Uh, musicians tend to gravitate toward the Russell science and philosophy more than more than others I've seen being a musician myself when I read it it just clicked there's a certain divine meter within the words and the wording of these mm -hmm. books and uh, don't forget to enter VANU20 all caps and you'll get 20% off until the end of March so if you're a listener out there you do a great service to help support the Russell legacy and the preservation and protection of the the Russell message, which is really going to be a life-changing thing when enough people get to understanding it and employing it in their own lives. And all things are possible if you, if you work knowingly with the creative mind power within you, call it God, call it divinity, call it the light, love, call it truth. It's, it's within each one of us and it can be ours for the asking. Oh yeah. Amen. Yeah. Cheers to that brother. Cheers to that. So, um, I guess just uh, last question here, I guess, uh, less, you know, um, yeah, last, last sure. question. Um, you, you, so you, you do other things too. You released a documentary recently. Um, you're a musician. Um, do you want to tell our audience, uh, about, uh, I guess, uh, um, some of the other work that you do before I let you go? Sure. Um, yeah, I've been documentary filmmaker for a while. Uh, they've gotten better. I'm self-taught. So you'll notice my early stuff is kind of crappy, but it gets better over time. Uh, the secret of light series is three hours and 33 minutes, uh, using video supporting videos to present the Russell cosmology. Is this your episode three thirty three? by the way? Uh, it is not. No. Um, I don't think so. Okay. No, 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 no. I just noticed the the Vonu podcast three three three. Yeah, this is this is our default Jitsi. I've used this for like a year. It's just the oh, meaning, okay. the meaning gotcha. room meaning room name. But yeah, and yeah, this is a cool platform, by the way. But yeah, for for my work, people want to check me out. Visit mattpresty.com. It's right here on the video. It's my name. Um, I've done. I've got a pretty large YouTube channel, seven thousand subscribers. But I'm encouraging people to get over to Rumble because I don't know how much longer my channel is going to last. In fact, I restarted my podcast, which is called Tech, T-E-C. It stands for the Exploration of Consciousness. And uh, I've got a good good four episodes going now. I'm going to do some more down the road. I'm just looking to uh, basically give people some inspiration to help them to change their lives. You know, I can never take credit for anybody's progress. It's always... All progress, all self-improvement comes from the individual, not from the outside, but from the inside. And uh, I just want to encourage people and inspire them to be the best versions of themselves that they can be. And so that's what my work is dedicated to. And uh, all my work can be found at mattpresty.com. And if you scroll to the bottom, you'll find my all my social media channels. I'm, I'm typically most frequently on Telegram. I do have a getter. I have a true social, but I just don't, you know, telegram is pretty much my go-to. I post mm -hmm. daily on that just about, and just try to keep the inspiration alive and keep myself in a patriotic um, approach, you know, to seeing our country, seeing us reclaim our country and our world from these tyrants and, and keeping freedom and the light of freedom burning bright for future generations. So I really appreciate the both of you, Bueller, uh, Shane, Rayo. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, thank you for that lovely bottle of whiskey. It was an absolute pleasure. <laughs> I'm going to try that uh, in the future. Uh, I'm currently on travel, so but I put it away in a very safe place. And <laughs> just want to say I really appreciate that again. And uh, I hope everybody checks out uh, Witness Distillery in Vandela, Illinois. It's a uh, pretty tasty looking place <laughs> <laughs> right on man that's uh that's that's all that's all fantastic and I'll, I'll have to try and get out to i didn't yeah again i didn't realize there was an actual you know um museum well, museum or whatever you what, whatever the um proper terminology is um but yeah, I, I gotta sure gotta get oh, yeah, out and, uh, just visit visit philosophy.org forward slash store and just remember vonu 20 yes. all caps v-o-n-u two zero and uh 
your listeners will save 20 percent and uh yeah philosophy.org has it's the it's the archive for the whole internet on all things dr walter and leo russell amazing amazing well matt it's been uh, it's been an honor um it's been a pleasure and i really appreciate you coming on and uh you know filling us in on on uh, all things walter russell at least you know a, a short you know hour and a half um introductory episode i really appreciate it. we'll have to get you back on in the future uh maybe as some of the some more of these projects become more concrete uh, we might, might have some more questions for you um because I mean, in addition to the browns gas, you, you, you might see behind me there's a medic, magnetic motor too which will be fun to do some testing with but um yeah lots lots of projects in the works but uh matt it's, it's been a, an honor and pleasure and uh, we'll have to get you back on yeah that sounds great i'd love to join you guys again and i'm gonna actually bring my wife and we're gonna come visit witness at some point in the future so i'll i'll definitely keep you in touch with that when that happens and uh looking forward buddy thanks so much oh. for the invite Amazing, amazing. Well, Bueller works there at the distillery too now, so um, well, yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah, oh, cool. it's all, it's right all uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that that's amazing to good hear. Deal. It'll be uh, be good to meet you. And um, yeah. Anyway, um, I guess guys, that's that's it for uh, this episode of the Vanu Podcast. Uh, VanuPodcast dot com for all things Vanu. Paznia p a z n i a dot com for all things the Free Republic. And uh, until next time, uh, always remember Vanu is yours for the making, and the Second Realm is yours for the building. Cheers. 2048, the second volume in the Brushfire thriller series, takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the war of ideas took place. The creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished for the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the freedom cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren, still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been band nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They are up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the TRIO, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the TRIO pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Libertyunderattack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom.